man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Those were the words of Job as he found himself in the midst of terrible suffering. And the outlook in the 12 verses that Stan read to us just a moment ago is rather pessimistic. It's certainly not the whole story. But if you, like Job, were sitting on an ash heap scraping your skin because you were covered with boils, I suspect it would be rather difficult for you to be very optimistic about your present circumstances and the future. I suspect if Brother Clark could speak to each of us today he would agree with the words of Job. Man is of few days and full of trouble. It is just a fact of life that we will experience problems and difficulties here in this life under the sun. And so I've decided to talk with you this morning about Christians facing problems. It's just a major misconception if anybody has the idea that, that Christians never have problems. Every Christian in this assembly this morning knows from their personal experience that that idea is just not correct. I fear that sometimes new converts may have the idea that when they put Christ on in baptism, all of their problems are just going to vanish and disappear. Some may even become oblivious to the problems in life. And yet the Bible wants us to understand that following Jesus does not eliminate all of life's problems. In fact, the New Testament teaches that becoming a Christian may very well bring other problems into your life. Listen to the words of Jesus as he sent the apostles out on the limited commission. He certainly warned them in no uncertain terms that they were going to experience difficulties. We'll begin reading in verse 16. He says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. And now drop down a few verses and read verse 21 and 22. Jesus goes on to say, Now brother will del deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And then dropping down to verse 34, Jesus goes on to say, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Christians will face problems in their life. But the important thing for us to know and believe 
is that while being a Christian does not eliminate the problems of life, being a Christian can help us overcome those problems. It really is possible for us to have an abundant life in Christ despite the problems that we will encounter. It is possible for us to be more than conquerors. But before I say more about that, think with me for a few moments about some of the various kinds of problems that Christian in, Christians encounter in their lives. One of the problems that we may have to deal with is prolonged sickness and pain. Now, everybody experiences minor sicknesses and minor accidents. That's just a part of being human. As kids, we all fell down and scraped our knees, and we wanted Grandma to put mercure chrome on us, and that would make it all better. Do they even make mercure chrome anymore? I guess I'm dating myself. We all experience those kinds of problems. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that there are some Christians who deal with pain on an everyday basis. They're never pain free. There are some Christians who suffer and sometimes greatly for years. I suppose my sister, who has MS, really never has a pain-free day. And sometimes, her trigeminal neuralgia is just excruciatingly painful. Fortunately, that's not always the case. It's certainly natural for a Christian who is experiencing ongoing pain and suffering to ask the question, why me? And I think we can understand that if someone is living with protracted pain, it could be very easy for them to become bitter in their outlook on life. The New Testament shows us that there's nothing new about this problem. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you think when Paul says that he pleaded with the Lord three times that that thorn might be removed, that those were three arrow prayers that Paul shot up to heaven in just a few moments of time? I suspect not. I suspect that Paul pleaded with the Lord earnestly in protracted prayer over a long period of time at three different times in his life. Paul knew what it was like to deal with this thorn in the flesh. And there's been all kinds of discussion and debate about what that was, and I don't know. And it's not important. I don't have to know but I know that there was something that Paul had to learn to live with, and he was able to do that. But how does one face 
serious illness and ongoing pain month after month, year after year. That's a problem that some Christians deal with. And some Christians deal with the problem that they have loved ones, family members, who have not obeyed the gospel. They're not serving the Lord Jesus. Maybe it's a parent or a child. Maybe it's a mate. Maybe they've never become Christians or maybe they were faithful Christians at one point in their lives, but they're not faithful now. That's a problem. And again, there's nothing new about that. There were Christians in the first century in that very situation. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 7, beginning in verse 12, But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Why would Paul say that if there were not Christians dealing with that very situation and circumstance? Many times our family members are good moral people, likable, lovable in so many ways, and yet they've not obeyed the gospel, and that means their sins have not been washed away by the blood of Jesus. That means that they are spiritually lost and separated from God, and that can be heartbreaking. On the other hand, there are Christians who have family members who are not all that good. There are Christians who have members in their family who are abusive and they use coarse, vulgar language and profanity. And that can be an ongoing evil influence that at least has the potential to erode our faith and our zeal. So how does a Christian deal with a problem like that? I was so fortunate to grow up in a home where my father and my mother loved each other and they loved us and they loved God. When I went away to college, I met Christians who didn't grow up in that kind of environment. They came from broken homes. And I marveled that they were doing so well. And I asked myself, well, Kevin, how, how, how would you be handling this if you had grown up in a situation like that? And sometimes Christians have to deal with the problem of mistreatment and slander and misunderstanding. I, I'm not talking about the random mistreatment that everybody experiences in life. I'm talking about the times when you act out of a good motive and despite that, you're mistreated and you're misunderstood and you're slandered because of what you've done. How does a Christian deal with that problem without becoming bitter and cynical? And some Christians have to deal with the problem of undeserved poverty. Now, we all understand that some people in life 
bring poverty on themselves, even some Christians, because they're lazy or they're foolish or they're wasteful. But again, I'm not talking about that right now. I'm talking about Christians who work hard and yet they experience poverty through no fault of their own. Maybe because of sickness or because of family obligations. Maybe they're experiencing business reversals. How does a Christian deal with undeserved poverty when there's seemingly no way out? But then there's another problem that some Christians deal with. And that's the problem of prosperity and wealth. Now, we don't ordinarily think of that as a problem. But the Bible teaches that it can be. Listen to Moses' words of warning to Israel as they were encamped on the plains of Moab, waiting to cross Jordan into the promised land, Moses says in Deuteronomy 8, verse 11, beginning, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full, and have built beautiful houses and dwelt in them. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your hand is li- a heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. If you're familiar with Israel's story, you know that Moses' words of warning eventually came true. Because of her wealth and prosperity, Israel eventually forgot the Lord. In Jesus' parable of the sower, he talked about seed being sown on the wayside soil, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, and and seed sown on the good ground. And he explained that the thorny soil represented those who hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Wealth and prosperity was a big problem for the rich young ruler, was it not? And it was a big problem for that rich farmer who did so well that he had to tear down his barns and build bigger barns to store all his stuff. Now, I suspect that everyone in this assembly this morning would likely not consider themselves wealthy or rich. But by world standards, we are, aren't we? Every one of us in this assembly are wealthy by world standards. We take for granted the fact that we can eat virtually any kind of food that we can afford and we can enjoy a wide variety of delicacies but there are people in this world there's a lot of people in this world who have to eat the same old thing every day because that's all they can afford it's 
So as Christians, how do we avoid the dangers that prosperity and wealth can bring to us spiritually short of selling everything we own? Don't really think that's what the Lord wants us to do. But then there is the problem of temptation. Temptations that young people experience. Temptations that they face. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. What can young people do who really don't have the experience and the maturity and the judgment that hopefully comes with age when they're faced with the peculiar problems and temptations of you. Some Christians have to deal with the problem of a handicapped background. I've already mentioned the fact that I was fortunate to grow up in, as we might say, a Christian home. Timothy was taught the truth and raised to have faith in God through the influence of his godly grandmother and his godly mother, despite the fact that his father was not a believer. But some Christians are not raised in the kind of environment that Timothy grew up in. Some Christians were raised in an irreligious and a wicked home. And as a result, these Christians have to overcome years of ingrained habits and selfishness and sin. Imagine the difficulty somewhat, someone might experience if he grew up in a home characterized by profanity, obscenity, vulgarity, and immodesty. That's, that's the environment that he grew up in. Imagine the difficulty in overcoming that. So what does a Christian do? What can he do when his background is a handicap and a hindrance to him? And then, of course, sooner or later, there's the problem of death. Either the death of loved ones or the prospect of our own demise. Now, obviously, there's nothing new about death, but it's still hard to deal with and hard to face when we lose a loved one or when we face the prospect of our own death. What can a Christian do to deal with the sense of loss that he experiences when a loved one dies? How does a Christian reconcile himself to his own approaching death? Well, these are just some of the problems that Christians have to deal with in their life. And becoming a Christian does not eliminate all of our problems. And as I said a little while ago, it can even bring new problems. But the thing that I want to emphasize is that becoming a Christian can enable us to overcome whatever problems we face if we approach them in the right way. That is confirmed by our Lord's own example. The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 4 and verse 15, 
For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Please note, Jesus wasn't isolated from the problems of life. He experienced the same kinds of problems, the same kinds of temptations that we experience, but he conquered them. And he didn't use miracles, which are not available to Christians today, to do that. I don't think Jesus used his deity to deal with his temptations to sin. I think he did that as a man. The experience of the Apostle Paul declares that it really is possible for Christians to overcome whatever problems they encounter in life. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 4 and verse 13, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. And please remember, when Paul wrote those words, he was writing from a prison in Rome with chains on his hands and or his feet. In the two verses that precede, preceded the statement I just read, Paul says, now that, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul knew about problems. Paul knew about suffering. Paul knew about headaches and heartaches and body aches. He experienced serious difficulties throughout his life. But he learned that he could live with those and overcome those. Jesus wants us to understand and believe that we can overcome whatever problems we face. And one of the reasons we've done that, we can do that is because God has promised to limit our, our temptations. I don't know how many times I have referred to this passage in the two years that I've been laboring with this church. But this single verse contains three wonderful promises. Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Paul says, my temptations are not unique. Whatever I'm having to deal with, I'm not the lone ranger. I'm not the only one out there. Dealing with that. I hated picking peas when I was a boy. But it was always easier to pick peas when my dad was out there picking peas with the rest of us. There's a great deal of consolation in knowing that my problems are not unique to me and my problems are not irresistible and there will always be a way out. There will always be a way of escape. Now it might be through a basement window rather than the front door, but God says there's always going to be a way out. And so if you believe the Bible, then you will believe that God's not going to allow you to face problems you can't endure. Of course, I can sympathize with the old black woman who, alluding to this verse, once said in, in an old movie, 
I've not seen the movie, but my friend Mark Alford in Bowling Green, Kentucky alluded to this, and this old lady said, I just wish the Lord didn't have quite so much confidence in me sometimes. I can, I can relate to that. But then the fact that we can overcome is confirmed by God's promise to never leave us. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 13, verse 5, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then the writer says, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Based upon what God has said, we can boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Notice God doesn't promise that our problems are going to vanish. But he does promise that his love and care which is far greater than our problems, will never vanish if we remain faithful to Him. And then may I suggest to you that the New Testament clearly teaches that we can overcome our problems and difficulties because we are repeatedly admonished to do that very thing. In the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia, there are seven admonitions to the overcomers. Now, I've said all of that so that I can remind you about a great source of consolation and help and guidance and strength that God has given his people and I suspect that you already know what source I'm talking about I'm talking about God's Word I'm not saying that it's the only source of aid and comfort and strength. God has certainly given us other sources to help us. And I am not saying that the Word of God will miraculously make the sick well, the rich humble and dependent upon God, the young and inexperienced mature, I'm not saying that the Word of God will take away all of our pain. But I am saying that the Word of God will provide us guidance and comfort and strength that will enable us as the people of God to overcome our problems that may not go away. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Peter tells us that we should be as newborn babes desiring the pure milk of the word that we may grow thereby. When the Apostle Paul bid farewell to the Ephesian elders in the port city of Miletus, he said, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And the psalmist says in Psalm 119 verse 11, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now 
Now, as I begin to circle the field, let me give you three illustrations of how God's Word helps us. First of all, it can guide us when we don't know what we ought to do about a particular problem. For example, what should a Christian do when his mate is not a Christian? Well, Peter talks about that. He writes in 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 1, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. And he goes on to urge the wife to develop the kind of inner beauty and inner character that will be winsome and attractive to her husband. So if you're faced with problems and you don't know what to do, God's given direction and guidance can be found in the Scripture. Of course, that necessarily implies that we need to know what the Scriptures say, does it not? And then secondly, God's Word can strengthen and motivate us when we know what we ought to do, but it's not easy to do it. We know that the New Testament teaches that we should love those who hate us and mistreat us, but that's hard to do. But God's Word can help us do difficult things by first of all reminding us what God requires Secondly, by warning us about the consequences if we do not do what God requires. Thirdly, by assuring us that we can do whatever God expects us to do. Fourthly, by promising His love and care for us. And then fifthly, by telling us about others who have done extremely difficult things with God's help. Then finally, may I say to you that God's Word can help us by correcting us when we think we know what we ought to do, but we find out that we're wrong. Sometimes, people mistakenly believe that they should give up living when a loved one dies. But God's Word shows us that that's not the right way for us to react to the death of a loved one. Do you remember how David reacted when his son died? In 2 Samuel chapter 12, Begin reading with me in verse 21. Then his servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he, meaning David, and he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. We've got to learn 
to live with death and not die. And so it's just a fact of life that Christians will inevitably face problems, problems that cannot be avoided, problems that we may have to live with for a lifetime. But we can overcome those problems with the Lord's help if we approach them in the right way. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 97, beginning, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more, mis more understanding than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. God's Word is absolutely indispensable. If we're going to deal with the problems that we experience in the right way, it tells us of God's great love for us. It tells us of God's plan to save us. It tells us of God's conditions of pardon. Let me conclude this morning by reminding you that the biggest problem that anyone can ever have is the problem of sin. Because sin's the only thing that separates man from God. And if there's unforgiven sin in your life this morning, you need to have that sin washed away by the blood of Jesus. If you're not a Christian, you can have that occur if you'll do what Peter told the very first converts to do on the day of Pentecost, know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when those on that occasion who were cut to the heart because of their sin cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter told those believers to repent and be baptized. That's what you need to do to have your sins washed away. If you're a Christian but you haven't been living as you ought to live, you need to do what Peter told Simon the sorcerer to do. Repent and pray, asking God to forgive you. If we can help anyone this morning, either establish or reestablish your relationship with God, we would be honored to assist you in any way that we can. You can respond to the gospel right now. We hope you will as we stand.